church, what would you list off? And I'll start from this end. What would you list off? Bible. Somebody said Bible. Great. Okay. How about this way? Elders here. What would you list off? Like non-negotiables for a church. People. You know, that's great. Music. Okay. Prayer. I <laughs> what else? Communion. Yes. Sacraments, right? Baptism and communion. All right. What else? Food. Okay. Well, we got to feed people. We have people and we have food. Great. And spiritual food too, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I would hope at the top of your list, you would include word, prayer, uh, sacraments, love for each other, and heart for the lost. Uh, of course, in our context, other things are closer to the top of the list, like music, age-appropriate ministries, multimedia, and programs for the community. But in both these lists, there is something not mentioned. How important to you is persecution and suffering? Would you list, would you list off persecution and suffering as a non-negotiable for the church? Isn't that what Paul is doing? Paul is saying that that is what's coming to you. Isn't that what Christ said is going to happen to you? There are a lot of verses that we can uh, open and read uh, and, uh, and, and focus on. Um, I grew up as a Muslim, not knowing who Christ was. I thought Jesus was not crucified. Muslims do not believe that Jesus was crucified. One day I saw a movie called Ben-Hur. In that movie, at the end of the movie, Christ was crucified. Anyone seen that movie? Not the, not the latest one, but the old one. Old one. Old one is like Charlton Heston, that handsome guy. All right. Um, and I wanted to know whether Jesus was crucified or not. If you want to hear my testimony in, in a, like a longer version, please talk to Pastor Brandon. Uh, he either memorized it because he heard it like so many times or... Um, uh, he has a recording somewhere. I'll give him a website where he, where he, can, he, he can give them to you. Um, I looked for a Bible. I looked for information. There was nothing available. Nothing available in 1987 in Turkey. And um, I thought all Westerners were Christians. I realized that the Westerners I met had nothing to do with Christ. Isn't, isn't that what Westerners think? Isn't that what Americans think about the Middle East? They're Muslims. But when you go there and you realize, ah, oh, not all Middle, Middle Easterns are Muslims. Um, so I went around and asked questions, and there was nothing available, nothing. Can you imagine, uh, as a Muslim, I'm looking for a Christian, and there's nothing, nothing, no Christians, no Bible, no book written by Christians. And one day I met an American couple, and that couple had a book in their backpack called the Nid. So I'm looking at it, and I said, what is this? What is this book? And they said, it's the Bible Christians believe in. So my journey began with that book. They invited me to a church. Then I ended up at a Turkish um, church plant, and I resisted everything that the Bible taught, but Christ had other plans. I became a Christian by resisting the gospel. I said, no, 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 this book, this book cannot be true. This book is, is just made up. It's just full of peop, you know, stories that people just made up, and it's corrupt. It's changed. But, you know, I realized that the only thing that was corrupt, and, and it was my heart, uh, and God changed me. Um, I did not. I tried not to become a Christian. And I became a Christian by resisting the gospel. And in the summer of 1988, I was baptized. A week later, a Turkish college student came to our church. And in a very short time, he said he became a Christian. It took me 10 months. It took him a week. I was jealous. It's like, what 
uh, what did you do? Like that, that it, it took you a week. You know, he was a police informant. He was a government informant trying to gather information about new believers and seekers. Um, he invited us to his house, and we were all arrested. Uh, all Turkish Christians were arrested in 1988, and we were asked to deny Christ. They made us sit in front of the, our interrogators, and they asked us to deny Christ. They said, if you say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger prophet, we will let you free. And the first guy stood up and said, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger prophet. He walked out. Second guy denied Christ, walked out. Third guy was a friend of mine. I was sure he would deny Christ, and he said, never, I will never deny Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. You do what you must. And they beat him up in front of us and put him in, um, in a cell. And it was my turn. I was afraid. There was this fear in my heart, and I was about to say there is no God, but I'll... somebody shut my mouth. A real hand shut my mouth. I could not deny Christ. And I thought someone behind me was doing it, and nobody was behind me. And I looked at the, this, uh, my interrogator, who was about to beat me, and he said, repeat after me. And I couldn't. How could I? The, man, the, the God, God I resisted, who pulled me into his saving grace, was now not letting me deny himself. I could not. They put me in a cell, and we who did not uh, deny Christ, we remained there for about 10 days, and we were beaten and tortured for 10 days. But then we were released, and at that time, the numbers in the country of Turkey were 80. There were 80 Muslim converts in the whole country, and, and it shifted right from there to 200. When persecution and suffering begins, the church grows, and that's what happened with us. And the numbers went up from 200 to 500, 500 to 10,000. And today, there are about 20,000 Turkish Muslim converts to Christ. And we probably have that many more who are not able to attend churches. Uh, today, with the remainder of my time, I would like to read a passage. Today, I was supposed to be um, preaching on Romans 11, and I uh, convinced Pastor Brendan that he would let me preach on Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And this is what God is telling you today. Behold, I am coming soon. Oh, that's another passage. I will, yes, he is coming soon. But I'm reading Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, and for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were who were to be killed as they themselves had been and this is what we see in the uh, in the book of revelation beloved congregation of the lord jesus christ in texas i i say the same thing in in izmir in smyrna which is one of the seven churches. What did you expect? What, like, did you think Christianity would be a, like a, a life of ease? A cakewalk, maybe? Did you think it would be um, a walk in the park? Did you think this vile wor world would be a friend to grace? Did you think this world would help you on to God? What did you expect? 
maybe health and wealth gospel, a name and claim and promise, a, a power of positive thinking outlook on life, a, maybe a feel-good religion, a religion that gives you this warm and fuzzy feelings, a religion that consists of a little more than everyone joining hands and singing Kumbaya. <laughs> we we uh, have this song uh, called How Beautiful Are the Mediterranean Nights. Uh, you, like all you know, Turks go to the beaches and hold hands and sing that. Um, if you're interested, just let me know. I'll show it to you on YouTube. It's, it's a beautiful song. But what did you expect? Maybe a rapture sparing you from any form of persecution, a, a golden age sparing you from any form of suffering. What did you personally, individually expect from this Christian life? Revelation 6, 9 to 11 sets before you a most sobering and realistic picture as it answers that question. Do you want to know what you, what you can expect from this Christian life? Then read Revelation 6, 9 to 11. As we read the book of Revelation, we see that things are getting more and more uh, intensified. Revelation 1, uh, and then we move on to the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters. And it's getting more and more uh, realistic, more and more intense, and the images are becoming more and more horrific, the scenes more terrifying, the issues are more pressing. We, as we read the book of Revelation, we have come to expect that. Um, and we see it here once more, once more in, this, in chapter 6. If you thought the opening of the first four seals was disturbing, wait till you see what the fifth seal shows you. If you thought the riding forth of the, of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was unsettling, wait till you see the unveiling of the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, says verse 9. The fifth seal is opened and we see Souls. The souls are not in possession of their bodies. Their bodies are in the ground, returning to the dust uh, from which they came. We see only souls. These are the souls. Um, these are those um, the, the, the souls of those who have died. Uh, John tells us as much. I saw under the altar. The souls of those who had been slain. Uh, not only are these souls of our souls of those who have died, these are the souls of those who have been killed, who have been uh, of, uh, who have died a violent death, who have been stoned, who have been beheaded, who have been hanged and cut in half. And these are the souls of those who have been burned as lamps to illuminate the arena. These, uh, the, and the souls of those who have been thrown to the lions. The souls of those who have been accounted as sheep for the slaughter. These are the souls of those who have been slain. For what reason have they been slain? For the word of God, this is what it says. The, the reason why they have been slain. Um, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Make no mistake, these are the martyrs, those who have died for the faith, those who have died for the word of God, those who have died for the testimony which they held, those who have died because they refused to deny Christ, because they refused to recant, those who have died because they refused to renounce, those who have those who held to the word of God, uh, though it cost them their life, those who held to the testimony and sealed it with their blood. These are the souls of the martyrs. These are the souls of all those who have died for the faith from the time of Christ's ascension to this very day. One of those souls is the soul of Stephen, 
the first martyr in the book of Acts. One of those, um, and, and, and the souls uh, of the apostles are there as well. Uh, history holds that Apostle Peter was crucified head down. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. Nathaniel was beheaded. Matthew was killed with a sword. Thomas was run through, um, run through with a lance. And the other James was thrown from a tower, stoned and then sawn in pieces. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, Judas was shot to death with arrows. Paul was most likely beheaded. And the souls, the souls of the apostles are there under the altar. The soul of Polycarp, my fellow pastor Polycarp, Polycarp was from Smyrna. The soul of Polycarp, who died a martyr at the age of 86, is there. He was brought into the arena and, and commanded to say of the Christians, away with the atheists. He replied by waving his hand toward the spectators in the arena, saying, away with the atheists. When he was threatened with wild beasts, he said, bring them on. And when he was threatened with fire, he said, you threaten me with fire, the pains of which last for an hour, but the pains of eternal fire await you. And he was burned at the stake. They asked him to deny Christ, and he said, for 86 years Christ did not deny me, and I will not deny him now. And he was burned at the stake. He did not recant. The soul of Polycarp is there. The soul of Blandina is there. She was tortured with every torture known to men, um, and she still would not recant. She was burned upon a hot iron chair, and she would not recant. Recant. She was suspended from a stake as food for the wild beasts, and she would not recant, and those wild beasts would not even touch her. She was finally placed in a net and thrown into a wild bull in an, in, in an arena, which finally killed her. She did not recant. The soul, the soul of Blandina is there. The soul of John Huss is there. The soul of William Tyndale is there. The soul of Guido de Bress, the author um, of um, a Reformation confession called Belgique Confession, is there. The souls of uh, the martyrs are there under the altar. And don't fool yourself, such martyrdom continues to this very day. Uh, in fact, the 20th century was a century of persecution in which more Christians died for their faith than in the previous 19 centuries combined. In 1915, Turkish authorities killed one and a half million Armenian Christians in a methodical way. The souls of those martyrs are there. Lenin said there can be no more abomin uh, there there can be no there can be nothing more abominable than religion and he ordered the persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church and then Stalin uh, extended that to every to all believers uh, all over the country the souls of those martyrs are there 1956 the Aka Indians of Ecuador killed Jim Elliot Pete Fleming, Ed McCauley, Roger Yondarian, and Nate Saint. The souls of those martyrs are there. And what of the 10,000 Cam Cambodian Christians um, slain, uh, slain in uh, 1975? The souls of those martyrs are there. What of the Christians slain in China? We don't even know the numbers. What of the Christians slain in Iran, in Indonesia? In Afghanistan, we do not even know the numbers. The souls of all of those martyrs are there. Such martyrdom continues to this present day. I, had a, I met this Muslim, Muslim man in 1994 and um, shared the gospel with him. And then later, other Christians shared the gospel with him. And he, he gave his life to Christ and... Um, and became an evangelist and, a, and then a pastor in eastern Turkey. And he was 
ask to recant Christ and leave Christianity for Islam. And he did not deny Christ. And they cut his throne, uh, they, they, throat. They cut his neck and uh, killed him. They tortured him and killed him. Uh, same thing happened to his elder and a German missionary. You may have heard of this in 2007, April 2007. And he died. The, the last words, the killers were, were caught. The last words he, uh, they said that he was saying is, la, is Messiah. I'm going to my Messiah um, and my friend's soul and, and, and his elder, the church elders, uh, Ur's soul and the German missionary, Tilman Geske, his soul. They are all dead. And where does John see these souls of the martyrs? He sees them under the altar. This is not the altar of incense that stood in the holy, uh, in the holy place just before the curtains of the, uh, the Holy of Holies. This is the altar of sacrifice. That altar that stood in the outer court. That altar upon which the animals were sacrificed. That altar uh, at the base of which was poured out the blood of the sacrifice. Where you would see the blood of the sacrifice on the Old Testament altar, you now see the souls of the martyrs. Their uh, the, um, uh, blood having been poured out, their blood have been, having been poured out as they have sealed their faith with their blood. Um, that's the scene set before you in the opening of the fifth seal in the book of Revelation. In view are the souls of all the mar martyrs who have died for their faith from, from the time of Christ's ascension to the time of his return on the clouds of glory. These, um, these martyrs cry out in verse 10. This is what they're saying. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. This is a cry for vengeance. Did you see that? This is a cry for vengeance. Notice it is the cry of those who have already been slain. Uh, it is the cry of the souls in heaven. It is not the cry of the Christian on earth. The Christians on earth are not crying, crying out for vengeance. Though the soul of Stephen in heaven today cries out, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That was not his cry in his martyrdom. Then he cried, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. In his death, he was conformed to his Savior. You remember the cry of Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The cry for vengeance comes only from the souls in heaven, not from those who still dwell upon the earth. Um, even in suffering, even in persecution, yes, even in death, the cry of the martyr is that of the martyr's Lord. Father, forgive. Isn't that what Stephen said? Father, forgive. While he was on the earth. Um, why the cry for vengeance from the souls in heaven then? Because they stand in glory, and their cry is based on the character of God. They call him Lord, and rightly so, for he has absolute power and authority. Uh, the Greek word, which is translated as Lord right here in this, in this uh, verse, uh, is the Greek word despotis where we get our word, the despotic, you know, despot. Um, what is a despot? It is one with absolute, it is one with absolute power and absolute authority. Uh, they call him holy and true. God, the all-powerful one with absolute power and authority, is holy and true, and his holiness and truth, he must, and in his holiness and in his truth, he must judge sinners. This he will do for sure. He has said, 
It is mine to avenge, and I will repay. For this judgment, the souls under the altar cry out. They are crying out for this judgment. And you see the Lord's response in verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. They're given a white robe and commanded to rest. The white robe is the righteousness of Christ. They have been liberated by Christ, and they have been consecrated by Christ. <coughs> and they have been crowned by the Lamb in the righteousness of the Lamb, and they rest. Already now, they enjoy this eternal Sabbath rest. And th that is their condition, even now. And yet, justice is delayed. Their blood has not, been, has not yet been avenged. Final judgment has not yet been poured out upon their enemies, which is also the enemies of Christ. Um, though they stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and though they already enjoy this eternal Sabbath rest, they anxiously await for the final judgment that was promised. And when shall that judgment come? John gives us an answer, and John tells us uh, they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Do you find that phrase disturbing? Do you find it unsettling? What can you expect of this Christian life? Your Lord tells you there are many, there are many yet to be killed as these martyrs were killed. What can you expect, Christian? In Revelation, what we're seeing is expect persecution. Expect suffering. Expect torture and the um, even death. Persecution, suffering, torture, and even death. This is normal. If you go out and preach Christ crucified, if you go out and live for the gospel and be a gospel-centered believer, Christian, you will be persecuted. You will be some where somehow persecution will come. Maybe in a different form. In America, you will see it in a different form. But the form that we're seeing in the Middle East uh, is not far, far away from you guys. You are Christians, and this is what your Christ is telling you. This is what Paul is telling you. This is what John sees. You are called fellow servants and brothers of these souls under the altar. Do you get the point? Your blood may, may very well run with theirs. Your blood may very well run with theirs. Are they your brothers? Are they your sisters who are in heaven under the altar? They are your brothers and they are your sisters and your blood may very well run with theirs. As disturbing and unsettling as this passage may leave us, it also hints in the most tender of terms at the comfort that is ours. Comfort in the midst of persecution, comfort in the midst of suffering, comfort in the midst of um, uh, torture, and comfort in the midst of death. Note again the place of these souls. They are under the altar. This is the altar by which you enter the presence of God. As one author has, writ has written, approach to God is impossible apart from sacrifice. This is the altar of sacrifice, the altar of the cross. And the, and the blood of the lamb that was sacrificed upon the cross 
pours down and it covers those souls under the altar. Yes, dear child of God, you are covered in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is shed, was shed for you. Let the blood of the Lamb, that, that blood which covers you, let that blood speak to you of how precious you are in the sight of your God. So precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He has ordained that judge, he has ordained that uh, judgment will, will not come until the number of the martyrs is complete. And God knows the number. God knows when that judgment day will come. He knows the number of the Christians. We don't know how many Christians there will be in that judgment day. He knows every single one of them. He knows the number of his children. He knows every last one of them. And not a hair can fall from the heads um, apart from, uh, I mean, not, not a hair can fall from their heads apart from his sovereign will. And notice that God measures the time until this judgment by the blood of the martyrs. When will the judgment day come? It's measured by the blood of the martyrs. Did you see that in, in this verse? God measures the time until the judgment, judgment day by the blood of the martyrs. As uh, Dennis Johnson has put it, he says, the days on God's calendar are marked off one by one in the blood of the martyrs. It's, this is not about the past. This is not something that just happened in the past. And that... Maybe, maybe you will not see it. Maybe you're seeing it already in, in subtle ways. Maybe in your government. Maybe in Texas. Maybe in California. Maybe in Arizona. Maybe in Minnesota. Maybe in downtown Portland or San Francisco. Wherever. This is not. This is not about being a Democrat or Republican or communist or socialist or whatever. This is about the gospel. This is about your soul. As each martyr dies, the cry of the soul under the altar increases. When Stephen died as the first martyr, it was a lonely cry, but the cry of the apostle soon joined his cry, and the souls of the early Christians soon joined the cry of the apostles. And the cry of the reformers soon joined the cry of the early Christians. And the cries of those who died in the last century has joined the cry of the reformers. Think of it. All the martyrs who have died for the word of God and for the testimony which they held from the time of the ascension of Christ to this very day and to this very moment are crying out in heaven and saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Do you think that cry falls on deaf ears? Do you think that cry goes unheeded? This is the cry of souls uh, whom Christ has died, for whom Christ uh, died. This is the cry of souls for whom the Lamb gave his life. This is the cry of those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. This is the cry of those who have been loved by the Lamb with an everlasting love. And do you think their cry falls on deaf ears? How foolish the wicked. How foolish those who would persecute Christians. How foolish those who would even put to death the followers of Christ. They stoned Stephen and thought that Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, would remain silent. They stoned him, but the cornerstone, they thought, would remain silent. They threw the Christians to the lions and thought that the lion of the tribe of Judah would remain silent. They burned. They burned Christians at the stake and thought that he, he whose eyes are like flames of fire, would remain silent. They thrust Christians through with the sword and thought that he will strike 
that, that he who will strike the nations with the sword of his mouth would remain silent. How foolish the wicked. Do you think the cry of the souls under the altar falls on deaf ears? Then look at the opening of the sixth seal. There you, shall, there, there, there you have the answer. There in verses 12 to 17, you have the answer to the cry of the martyrs. The day of judgment is the answer to the cry of, of the souls under the altar. And don't be fooled. It is only a little time until that day. This, then, is what you can expect. This is the life of the church. This is the life of the Christian. This is the life of the missionary. This is the life of the pastor. You can expect persecution. You can expect suffering. You can expect torture. You can expect death. It is the most sobering and realistic picture. Is this not what you expected? Then you better look at our history, the, the church history, history of Christianity. If this is not what you expected, please read the Bible. Then um, um, the Word of God will show it to you. And you'd better hold to the Word of God. There is a distinction here, a distinction between those who hold to the Word of God and, and to the testimony and those who dwell upon the earth. There is a separation between the sheep and the goats. There is a separation between the wheat and the tares. There are those who claim to be Christian and yet do not hold to the word of God. There are those who claim to be Christian yet do not hold to the testimony. There are those who claim to be Christian and yet have no regard for the blood of Christ. There are those who claim to be Christian and yet have no regard for the righteousness of Christ. There are those who claim to have faith, but it is not saving faith. Even the demons believe and shudder. What is true faith? And true faith clings to Christ. It clings to Christ in persecution, in suffering, and in death. And in clinging to Christ, it is conformed to Christ. As Christ was accounted as a sheep before the slaughter, and as he was killed, so also the Christian. In Romans 8, 36, Paul says, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We are killed all the day long. What then is your comfort, Christian, as you face persecution, suffering, and even death? What is your comfort? And your comfort is this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Your, your enemies, your enemies may bring you tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril. They may bring you the sword and kill you all the day long. But this they cannot do. They cannot separate you from the love of God that is yours in Christ Jesus your Lord. Amen.